Shopify Masters is powered by Shopify, the easiest way to sell online, in person, and anywhere in between. To get an extended 30-day trial, visit shopify.com slash masters. For a lot of folks, you can you know create a plastic prototype, um, I'd say for you know under a couple hundred dollars. Hey, my name is Felix, and I'm the host of Shopify Masters. Each and every week, we learn the keys to success from e-commerce experts and entrepreneurs like you. In this episode, you'll learn how much time and budget it takes to get a prototype 3D printed, why this company chose to use Google AdWords instead of Facebook ads, and how an educational content page can be one of your highest converting pages. Today, I'm joined by Chris Little from Wintersmiths. Wintersmiths designs and develops premium barware products for home and commercial use and started in 2012 and based out of Moortown, Vermont. Welcome, Chris. Thanks for having me, Felix. Big fan of your show. Thank you so much. So yeah, tell us a bit more about the, the, the products that you sell and the kind of customers that you have. Absolutely. So as you said, we um, create clear ice making tools, uh, both for home bartenders uh, and, and for the professional bartender as well. And, you know, I think... Um, we, we, like a lot of entrepreneurs, sort of started the business um, by trying to solve a problem um, that we were experiencing personally. And in particular, it was how do you create clear ice uh, for cocktails for the most part? And, you know, it really started with my previous job. I was working uh, in the software space, um, product marketing, corporate development in Boston. And I was traveling a lot to uh, Japan and Korea. And I remember one particular trip, uh, I was actually in Tokyo, and I went to a um, a whiskey bar and was served sort of this large uh, crystal clear ice ball um, with my whiskey. And, you know, I think there's something really remarkable about that at the time. And this is back in um, probably 2011, 2012. Uh, You know, it was really sort of the beginning of this uh, trend in craft cocktails and clear ice. And you really you really weren't getting a lot of clear ice at bars and restaurants. um, And you certainly weren't getting ice balls. So, you know, I returned home um, and I looked into purchasing one of the devices that actually makes ice balls. And at at the time they were incredibly expensive. You would end up paying uh, several hundred dollars to even over a thousand dollars for essentially an aluminum press um, that would melt down a block of ice into a ball. And, you actually had to create the clear ice beforehand to even use that product. So that's sort of what sparked this idea, um, you know, that we we could maybe engineer a better product that would do this faster um, and, you know, more reliably and and at a better price. Got it. So you looked at the competition out there and you saw that they, there were some established players already. Uh, They were much more expensive though. What made you think that you could introduce a better product at a, at a better price point? Yeah, you know, it's funny. I I didn't actually set out to create a business. Um, like I said, I was in the software space, so didn't have a lot of experience in in e-commerce um, and, or product development for, for that matter. And you know, it took a lot of a lot of testing. I would say, um, you know, a lot of trips to Home Depot and and building prototypes and taking up the freezer space um, that my girlfriend now wife was was pretty pleased with. Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, until we sort of got to the solution, you know, it wasn't clear to me that we could create a better option. It seemed like something that a lot of folks had tried. Um, if you look online, there's a lot of, uh, you know, red discussions or you know, other places where you can see people talking about creating these sort of homegrown DIY um, clear ice solutions. So, you know, it, it, uh, it took a lot of r and I'd say, to kind of get to the point where we're at. Got it. So walk us through some of these iterations and what are some of the milestones along the way that made you uh, realize that this could become a reality? Sure. So, you know, ultimately what we figured out is that, um, you know, you make clear ice essentially by controlling the freezing process. So if you can control uh, the way that the water freezes, uh, you know, sort of top to bottom layer by layer um, and provide a way for air bubbles and impurities to leave the water. Uh, you can you can create clear ice. So then it really once we figured that out, it really became you know how do we make this into a consumer product that's easy to use, um, you know for for the home, but also in, in bars and restaurants. And so our first product back in 2013 was the ice baller, 
um, which created a single ice ball at a time. It took took about 24 hours to make. Um, you know, the iterations, I guess, were, you know, purchasing a lot of different insulated containers and, you know, doing a lot of 3D printing work. Um, so we, one thing I'd recommend anybody listening is, is really to leverage how easy it is to create prototypes these days. Um, you know, 3D printing, you can make stuff that is rubber-like. Um, there's a process called cast urethane, uh, if you're familiar with it, where you can actually create very similar to silicone rubber like product, um, you know, for a lot less than, than going into full scale manufacturing. So we did a lot of that, a lot of 3D printing um, to kind of get something that functioned the way that we wanted it to um, and that consistently produced clear ice. So this 3D printing that you're doing to create these prototypes, can you walk someone walk us through it? If someone doesn't have an experience at all with 3D printing, what are the initial steps to to go down this path of creating prototypes with 3D printers? Sure. Yeah. I mean, the hardest part is certainly the the 3D model. Um, so creating um, using CAD software to create a 3D model um, that you can then upload to a 3D printing company. We used um, Quick Parts a lot which is a division of 3D systems. Um, and once you have that 3D file, you can print in a variety of different finishes um, and materials. And, you know, if you're really just trying to sort of get something in your hands and see what it feels like and see how it works, you know, for relatively, um, you know, relatively inexpensively, you can get that made in, in a sort of uh, plastic material that, um, you know, to explain 3D printing, if you're not familiar, it's sort of layer by layer additive manufacturing. So it's creating um, a 3D model using um, just sort of melted plastic in layers is the best way to describe it. Yeah, it's really cool to take a look at uh, how it's being done as the layers get built on top of each other, like you're explaining. How long did this process, how long does it usually take between the time that you uh, have a CAD drawn already and then send it out to a 3D printer? How long does it take before they turn it around? Uh, it's usually a few days. It can be a few days to a week. Um, you know, they have really quick turnarounds. So, um, you know, I, I'd say that's key. That was key to our early success. And it's something that we still, you know, spend a lot of time and money on these days is, is making those models and, and getting things just right. And for the initial prototypes that you created, what kind of budget are we talking about? You mentioned it was relatively inexpensive. Is that like, you know, hundreds or thousands of dollars? Well, so for us, it's a little more expensive to make something that's rubber like. Um, and when you're freezing it, um, you know, you're putting it under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress. So, you know, the plastic 3D printing wouldn't really work for our application. But for a lot of folks, you can, you know, create a plastic prototype, um, I'd say for, you know, under a couple hundred dollars, depending on the size of it and complexity. Got it. And I'm assuming that the first one you get back is not going to be the final iteration. Do you remember how many times you had to go through the 3D printing prototyping process? It's a good question. Um, I'd say, you know, for the first product, certainly three or four times, probably, uh, in addition to kind of the more, uh, the more sort of DIY mini, uh, prototyping that we were doing on our own. And then for, you know, our subsequent products, probably a similar amount of times, maybe a little bit more for our most recent product. And so when you do get back one of the prototypes, what kind of evaluation or, or criteria are you looking at to, to make tweaks for the next iteration? Yeah, so for us, we we have to make sure that whatever we're manufacturing sort of fits with the other components. So, you know, for a lot of um, new products, there might it might be mating with another part. Um, you know, in our most recent product, that's a stainless steel container. Uh, in our first product, that was also a smaller um, stainless steel container. So making sure the fit is right, uh, and then also testing to make sure that you can extract clear ice, um, you know, in a relatively easy way. Got it. So before all of this happens, you mentioned the the using CAD software to to create the I guess the digital prototype first. Do, is that something that is, that's hard to figure out for someone that hasn't used it before, or should you hire someone to help with this? Yeah, I would say it's it's pretty challenging to do on your own if you're not familiar with it. My brother and co-founder is actually an aeronautical engineer, so he went to college for uh, for engineering, and he's got a lot of experience with CAD. So he does those models for us, 
Uh, so I'd probably recommend if, if somebody's not familiar with it to hire someone. Um, it's a pretty big learning curve if you want to take it on yourself. Mm. Is there a specific title uh, or a specific job, uh, I guess, job title that you're looking for when you're hiring someone to help with this? Um, you'd probably be looking for a product engineer, some sort of, um, you know, 3D design type profession. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, now, when you were going through these iterations, what made you guys realize that, that you had a, a version of prototype that was ready to move forward to the next stage? You know, really just, just the testing. Like I said, I think eventually you get to a point where, you know, it works consistently and you can kind of go out and actually get, get pricing to manufacture a certain number of units. And I think that was probably one of the more challenging things for us was trying to find the right partners in the supply chain. Um, you know, tr trying to find a silicone manufacturer, both you know, in the United States or abroad, uh, you know, stainless steel manufacturer, plastics manufacturers along the way, you know, we've, we've sent a lot of, uh, contact us sort of emails or forms on different websites and some you hear back from and, it's not quite a good fit or they won't do the low volume you might need to get started. So that's a bit of a challenge to sort of figure out who your suppliers are going to be. Um, but once you actually piece that together, uh, you know, you can sort of grow some great relationships there. Mm. Well, what resources did you use to find these manufacturers? Did you just like Google around or are there particular directories that you recommend people check out they are interested in trying to find a manufacturer? Mostly just just Googling, you know, we it, it's really challenging to, to kind of find somebody uh, at, at a low volume and, and sort of get them to take you seriously, especially if it's your first product. You know, now that we've got a few products in the market and we have a website, um, it's it's definitely much easier to get somebody to respond to your your phone call. Uh, so, you know, I'd say just don't uh, don't give up hope and, mm -hmm. you know, keep trying because you will get through somebody that'll help you. And a lot of times those people are what sort of guides your next iterations to, you might have a conversation with somebody that, you know, is willing to take the time to explain different types of, you know, rubber durometer, which is the, um, you know, the squishiness of the rubber. They might explain to you different plastics and the properties and stuff like that. So, You'll find people along the way that'll that'll really help you grow as well. So now that you've been through this experience of finding a manufacturer, are there any certain characteristics or uh, types of manufacturers that would be willing to work that you can that will be more receptive to working with a uh, someone that's printing or sorry that someone that's producing at the lower volume? Well, it, it's hard to say. It's sort of sometimes they'll they'll be open about it on their website that they're they're open to take on some smaller volume projects. So you look for that first. Sometimes they'll get excited about an idea and be willing to, to take it on in the hopes that they'll see larger orders in the future. Uh, so it, it kind of depends. I'd say if you find somebody that looks like a good fit, it doesn't hurt to reach out and, and see if they're open to it. Um, but they might actually say on their website, they'll do some small runs and help you kind of prototype something new. Mm -hmm. Now, when you are working or, find, or I guess, um, reaching out to these manufacturers, what are you sending them? Are you sending the CAD drawings, the actual, I guess, a physical prototype? Yeah, so usually they will need that to, in order to give you an accurate quote. Uh, so you sort of have to get to that point to actually see, you know, what is this going to cost? And, and really that informs what your Kickstarter campaign looks like. We've been successful in three Kickstarter campaigns and have you know, obviously amazing backers wouldn't be here without them for sure. Um, but, you know, along that process, or once you get those quotes, you're figuring out what the pricing is on your Kickstarter campaign or, or, you know, if you're just launching the product on your website, you're figuring out how to price it or you're figuring out how much money you need to raise to actually get an initial order placed. Got it. So let's talk about that next step then. So once you have identified manufacturer, was that when you started going down a route of trying to find a, uh, or starting a crowdfunding campaign or was this done in parallel? Yeah, that's exactly right. For us, I think some people actually do launch a crowdfunding campaign before they do that. I think that's a bit of a mistake because they're, 
you really don't, you need to understand all the costs involved to understand how much money you should raise to be successful. And I think that's why you see, you know, some Kickstarter campaigns don't quite make it to the finish line, even after they raise the funds, because they haven't really uh, adequately looked at how much it's all going to cost to to put it together and actually fulfill it. So we lined up manufacturing ahead of time on all of our campaigns, you know, have very firm agreed upon pricing with the partners. And even though we might change some things before we go into full scale production, we might make some final tweaks. We feel pretty close to where it's going to end up. Do you find that the backers, the crowdfunding backers are more likely to fund a campaign if it looks like it's further along or does that not come up as, as much as you, you would think? I think it does help a lot. You know, ultimately they're investing in you as a creator, they're investing in the story. Um, but the, the more you can sort of tell them about the product and, and where it is along the way, the better. Um, you know, it's, it's a little tricky because at that stage in, in developing a new product, you're, you're also a little wary of people ripping it off. Um, so you have to be careful about how much you share and if you already have intellectual property covered there or not. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a balancing act in terms of you know, how much you need to provide to get people on board and how much you need to kind of hold back until you're ready. Got it. So let's talk about that first campaign. Uh, it's for the, the ice baller and you had a goal of $20,000, which you blew past, raised $173,000 from over 1,700 backers. Uh, so let's talk about that goal. Was that goal strictly for manufacturing? Like how did you guys figure out how much to to uh, set as a goal? Yeah, exactly. That, that was just for sort of creating the, the initial tools, the, the steel molds to create the product. Um, you know, it didn't, it didn't account for a lot of production, I'd say, um, but it would cover sort of some of those initial large capital costs, uh, you know, to get those tools made. So this was really great validation for us that there was this community of people that, you know, had been looking for a solution to this problem. And, um, you know, it sort of, it definitely kickstarted us into really thinking uh, about this becoming a real company. Got it. So you said the 20,000 covered that initial tooling and it sounds like basically set up for preparation for larger scale production, but it didn't actually cover the production itself. How were you able to, to I guess, cover that part now that you had to essentially provide, I'm assuming over 1,700 uh, versions of this product? Yeah. So by raising the, the additional funds, you, you know, we're sort of, we're covering a larger production run that provides us with enough product to fulfill the orders through the Kickstarter campaign, but also, you know, have some additional inventory to, uh, to keep things running and, and, you know, keep developing new products or, you know, building a website or, you know, making sure we have enough to ship all around the world and all that kind of stuff. So, it, it, you know, as you, Obviously, as you scale up on Kickstarter and as you raise more money, the costs go up as well. So it's it's sort of a linear function. It, it gets better when you raise uh, more money, but it can also be more challenging because um, you know all of a sudden you've got your costs are going through the roof, um, and you have to find the right partners that can fulfill a much larger volume of orders than you might have anticipated. Got it. So the twenty thousand goal, because you blew past it, you're able to use some of those funds to actually uh, cover the production run. Did you have a plan in place if you were only going to hit twenty thousand, and now you had to uh, pay for or basically pay for the initial production run without having the, I guess, without selling it all yet? Yeah, I'd say we we had a rough plan. I mean, I, we ultimately thought that we would ship. Uh, the units ourselves, you know, we are anticipating we get, you know, a, a reasonably small response from folks like us, we'd be able to create a product that we could use that we would be happy about, and, you know, put it in the hands of some other, um, you know, connoisseurs of, of scotch and whiskey. Um, but blowing past it, we ended up having to revisit that plan and, and find a fulfillment partner uh, that could sort of do this at, at a scale that we couldn't do out of our apartments at the time. Got it. Now, what kind of marketing did you do to help uh, get to, you know, blasting past your, your goal? So what's interesting is that was that campaign was entirely organic. Um, you know, I think part of it was probably the timing, you know, coming coming out sort of right around the time that, that this craft cocktail trend was sort of taking off and um, folks were starting to, to think more about clear ice and different types of of cocktails. I think that helped us. Um, but 
we didn't do any marketing other than using Kickstarter as our marketing platform. Mm -hmm. And you've launched future products since then, or future projects since then, and they've all done like, almost like I guess double or almost double each each time in terms of uh, funding uh, raised. Uh, what have you learned along the way? Like, what what are some uh, some must haves now that you are experienced here? What are some must haves in terms of the the, the actual listing on Kickstarter, the video, the photos? Like, what have you learned there? Yeah, you know, I think what's most important is finding a really active community that that will follow your your products throughout uh and that'll continue to support you you know we find that even the with these three different campaigns all being in a similar category of products uh we have a lot of backers who come support us each time um you know they want the next version or they want to continue to to support our company so you know finding that really active niche and and you know investing in customer service and support and making sure that you're making these these folks feel like part of the growth um it has been a, a big part of our success for sure i think beyond that is is certainly the basics of content photography making sure your kickstarter page um you know looks really professional i'd say our first kickstarter campaign um didn't look great. <laughs> um, and we've, we've improved upon the sort of the quality of, of the content and the photography each time we've done it. I think that really, really helps as well. Just making people feel like you're putting a professional uh, face forward. You're really investing in the products and the experience and you're going to follow through and, and, you know, make sure that they have a good experience as well. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like the, the uh, biggest, uh, boon to your success on Kickstarter is around having repeat backers then people that are part of the community and they want to keep on supporting you and you mentioned that you want to include them as a part of the story you want to build a community around your your brand around the products what does this mean to you on a day-to-day -day basis like what are some things that you and your team uh, consider must do's to continually improve and build the community having great customer service is certainly the most important thing responding quickly to, to questions or concerns, um, you know, listening to, to your customers and, and coming up with new products that fulfill their needs, keeps them interested and engaged. And also, you know, not um, at the same time, not annoying them with, with too many emails and um, communications that are, that are sort of superfluous. Uh, that's, that's been our approach and you know, our customers, I think have thanked us for that. You know, it's, it's interesting when you, when you launch a company on Kickstarter and you sort of grow it the way we did, you, your your biggest ally really is is word of mouth. Uh, and you know these folks are going to be out there talking about the project that they backed on Kickstarter, talking about how great it is to their friends and family. Uh, and so, making sure you help foster that community and, and putting those people in a position where they want to talk about you is is something that really helps you grow. Mm. Now, beyond Kickstarter, now that you have a, a business and you've launched these products, well, what other kinds of marketing work well for you? So we definitely use Google AdWords. Uh, so we drive traffic through uh, through Google by, you know, folks looking for clear ice and, and keywords related to it. Um, that's been a big avenue. I'd say we also do a lot with bars and restaurants and hotels around the world. And uh, that exposure tends to drive sales for us as well. Uh, so sort of, you know, word of mouth through uh, industry professionals. We also do a lot on Instagram. So a lot of influencers who work with on Instagram who will post giveaways and features of, of you know, our ice and our products. Um, those are probably the, the two main things we do to drive traffic. Yeah, so you, you mentioned, uh, I think three though, you mentioned that the Google AdWords, uh, the bars, restaurants, and hotels, and Instagram. Out of those three, which one do you think is the most uh, important or which one of the, these channels do you think that is, is, is most important for you? I'd say word of mouth is, is most important. So both these bars, restaurants, hotels, uh, you know, spreading the word about us, you know, that's where a lot of folks are learning about uh, different types of cocktails, um, different types of bar tools, and so they're finding out about how to make clear ice through uh, the bartenders that they know and they respect. Um, then also, you know, word of mouth just from customers who are early adopters mm -hmm. of the product. And then probably second to that would be um, would be Google AdWords. We, we tend to see a, a pretty good return on that investment as well. 
Got it. So these uh, these bars and restaurants and hotels, the bartenders that are working there, are they just coming across your product themselves? Are you doing some kind of active outreach directly uh, towards them to to get them to, or like, you're, you, are you walking into these places and, and talking to them? Like, how, how how are you getting them involved? It's a little bit of both. I'd say the majority of them are coming to us organically. Uh, and they're, you know, either replacing an in-house ice program where they, you know, purchase large cubes or spheres from a local ice distributor and they want to do it in-house. Uh, so they'll find us online that way. We do reach out to some of the top, you know, cocktail bars and restaurants around the world to, uh, you know, to get them involved. And we offer some bulk uh, mm-hmm. pricing discounts for folks that are in the industry. So it's, it's a little bit of both, but I'd say the majority are, are sort of just finding us, um, through Google and, and through some of our, um, either through our ads or through the fact that we, we come up pretty highly in searches for clear ice, um, because of how early we started and the content on our site. Got it. Yeah. So I definitely want to get to that organic traffic and Google AdWords in a second. And now when the, when you are doing essentially what sounds like outbound sales at, uh, towards these, uh, these establishments, uh, do you have like an in-house team doing that? Or you have you hired someone to help with that? What's that process like? Yeah. So we run a pretty small team here. So it's just my brother and I, uh, so most of that effort is done by me. Uh, and you know, it's a lot of, cold emails, cold calls, um, trying to understand what their ice program looks like, what are their challenges and and finding an area that we can help improve. Got it. So how does that conversation usually begin, you know, for someone out there that doesn't have any experience in sales and just wants to think that the best avenue is to start reaching out and just making cold emails or, or a cold phone calls. How does, how do you begin the conversation? Yeah. You know, I think it's really trying to get their attention first off. Um, you know, a lot of these folks are, are very busy. Uh, they, you know, this might be, um, might be their full-time job, might be something that they do in addition to something else. Uh, but they have a lot of moving, uh, parts in, in their, in their work life. So you have to get their attention either in, in our case, we're, we're saving them money. Um, if they're using a local ice distributor, sometimes they're paying, you know, tens of thousands of dollars a year, to get, uh, ice in for, for their customers. So, you know, hitting on some of the key benefits of, of, you know, saving them some money, but also, uh, targeting how great clear ice is and how this will help improve, um, you know, how customers see the end product, the cocktails that they get from that place. Um, and, and so if you show them some photography, if you, if you hit on some of those key points, you, you tend to be able to get their attention pretty quickly uh, and they'll be willing to at least hear you out. Got it. So let's move on to the uh, Google AdWords. Is that also done in-house or have you hired someone for that? Yeah, that's also done in-house as well. Yep. Got it. For someone that's getting started for the first time with AdWords, any tips on, on how to create your first uh, campaign? Like what are some some rule of thumbs that, that, that you follow? Um, well, I'd say start off pretty, pretty small and, you know, keep an eye on it. I think, I think it makes sense to, um, to always be testing and and tweaking your campaigns, um, you know, making small changes here and there, and then you'll get to a point where you don't need to spend as much time maintaining it. Um, and it's, it's sort of providing a good stream of, of traffic for you on a day to day basis. But you know, start out with a small budget. Think about the terms that would get somebody to your site. Um, somebody that's sort of far enough down the funnel and close to actually making a purchase decision. So, you know, for us, we, we probably wouldn't want somebody that's, you know, looking for an ice tray, right? Um, mm-hmm. They're probably just looking for an inexpensive solution. Uh, they don't, they might not care about clear ice. They might not be, um, you know, even into making cocktails. But if somebody searches for, you know, clear ice balls for cocktails or a clear ice maker. Um, that's something where we would expect them to be further along the funnel, closer to actually making a purchase. Got it. That makes sense. So, you know, things like Facebook ads are like the hot topic right now. What made you choose to go with PPC through AdWords rather than, you know, on a, I guess a social media platform like Facebook? Yeah, we've done some Facebook. I'd say, my experience, I had a little more experience with AdWords, so I felt more comfortable doing it there. Uh, we've done some advertising through Instagram. 
of course, also part of Facebook. Um, we haven't had a ton of success on Facebook. I think, I think we could, I think there's opportunity there. We just, you know, it's more of a, um, uh, you know, a sort of management of our time where we put, where we put our effort makes sense. So let's talk about the, the website a bit and uh, would love to have you walk us through your, your website design. What are some of the, your favorite parts about your current website? Sure. So I, I love the photography on our website. I think it, it really gets across what we do pretty quickly. Um, and, you know, we, we, we try not to be uh, overly verbose and, you know, talking too much about uh, what each of the product does, I think it becomes pretty clear right off the bat. So I think keeping it simple to the point, having really um, strong photography, high resolution is key. Um, and, you know, I think Shopify helps us sort of be very streamlined in, in how we do it. I also love that we can offer a lot of different payment options like Amazon Pay is becoming really popular uh, or PayPal, et cetera. So you know, it's, it's, we're really removing a lot of the barriers, I think, for folks to figure out who we are, what we do, and, and to easily make a purchase. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the photography where you mentioned that it's very clear what the product does, I think that's that's so key for, or like, or can you say a little bit more about that? Like, how do you make sure that you are demonstrating the, the, the value of the product and, and, and what it's meant to, to be, how, how it's meant to be used? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess for us, it's, it's pretty simple because we're, we're so targeted in terms of what we do. It gets harder if your store, you know, has a lot of different types of products. Um, you know, for us, we do one thing. So making sure that we talk about, um, that one thing and, and, and show it in photography is, is sort of the main thing we focus on. Um, you know, I'd like to add more video over time. I think that's certainly a, a, a really good way to get people to understand how it works and, and why it's it's something they might want. Uh, so I think that's one area that we could certainly improve. But, um, but you know, I, I just focus on making sure you're making the best um, photography available on your site that you can. You mm -hmm. know, it's one of those areas that it's probably um, advantageous to hire uh, a photographer or somebody that professionally takes product photos to, to, um, to really increase the, um, you know, the professionalism on your site. I think it's obvious for most people when you go to a site that, um, you know, that doesn't have high res photos or, or has, um, photos that weren't edited in Photoshop that, you know, people might take that a little less seriously. What do you think is the most engaging page on your website? I'd say it's probably our Clear Ice 101 page. This is a page that we get a lot of search engine traffic to organically. Uh, it really describes the science behind Clear Ice and how to make it and how um, how our products do that. It also talks about you know why that's important and you know how shape matters in terms of uh, dilution rates. Uh, and it also sort of just just walks through all the benefits, um, some of the myths around, you know, folks that have maybe tried to make clear ice at home and, and failed. And so I think it's really informative uh, and helps guide people into understanding why we're doing what we do. Yeah, I, I like that you have a, a content, an educational content page, it's one of your top engaging sites that people are coming to or discovering through organic search. Once they land on that page, other than them just clicking around your your navigation bar and finding out about your product. Are there ways to introduce your product or try to uh, convert a sale through that, that educational page? No, we don't, we don't do anything other than sort of guiding them into the understanding of, of, um, of what our products do. Uh, you know, I think there's a lot of confusion as to how, how to make clear ice. You'll see a lot, you know, on Instagram, you might see somebody, post a picture of, of a drink with a cloudy ice ball and people will chime in, you know, you need to use distilled water, you need to double boil it, or, you know, you need to um, do something different. And, and none of that really works. And I think it's just one of those areas that people are, um, you know, very engaged on the topic, but they're not really entirely sure how it works. So we try to be as transparent as we can on, on the process and the science. Mm -hmm. And that was a site uh, designed in house, or did you hire a designer for this? Yeah, this was all in house. Um, we used uh, a modified standard Shopify theme. You know, I think over the years, I've I've spent a lot of time just learning the Liquid code in Shopify, which has just a really been a really quick way to to 
modify a website and kind of get it to, to looking and feeling the way you want. Mm. Did you, do you know what theme you, you chose? So we used the Shopify narrative theme uh, out of the box, and then we made some modifications to that. <laughs> Sorry, got cut out there. Um, so other than uh, the design on, on the, uh, the site, what, uh, what do you think may is required to have a high converting e-commerce site based on your experience uh, so far? Well, you know, I think the biggest thing is to have, um, like I said, great photography, uh, great content that, that sort of helps people understand what you do. I think also just listing some of your uh, more important benefits, like how long it takes you to ship an order, if you offer free shipping, um, you know, what's your return policy, things like that. That helps just get people comfortable with, with shopping on your site. And then, you know, having a very frictionless checkout process, which I think Shopify does a great job with. And like I said earlier, you know, there's a lot of different payment options and it's pretty easy to, to move through that process without a lot of friction. Yeah, I like that on the top of your site, it does list those three promises that you talked about, which is that the order ship in one to two days worldwide, free U.S. shipping over $75 and 30 day money back guarantee. How did you come across or how did you know to choose those three I guess, statements to show on the top of your website? I think it's something you kind of uh, come up with after you do customer service for a while. I mean, I'm lucky enough to, to, you know, for us to have a small company where I do a lot of the customer service. So I understand what people's concerns are. You know, if somebody emails me once a week, um, a different person asking about the return policy or, you know, if somebody needs an order quickly, you know, you, you sort of see those trends through customer service and you can get ahead of them and make sure you're not, you know, the, if you think about it, if somebody's spending the time to send you an email, there's probably at least a dozen other people that aren't sending you that email, but could have potentially been customers. Got it. So you basically pay attention to what people are concerned about. It's almost like a, the three most frequently asked questions before the conversion that you're putting up there. Like what are the, the three things that are blocking them potentially from making a purchase? So what, what kind of applications do you use on, on the website, either through Shopify or any other tools that you use to help run the business? Yeah, so the, uh, the actual apps that we use are uh, we use now back in stock, which is just if we, you know, have a short period of time where we might be out of stock of an item, uh, we can collect email addresses and send a note when it's back in stock. Um, we do this is a tool called um, Covet.pix, which is an app that we can show Instagram photos on product pages. You know, a lot of our customers are, you know, essentially their review is is them posting on Instagram and tagging us and saying, you know, look what I made, how great is this. Um, so being able to show those images on the site is helpful uh, as well. And then, you know, we use a lot of tools that are outside of Shopify as well. MailChimp uh, is important for us. Less accounting for accounting. Um, we use uh, Celery, Try Celery for pre-orders uh, as well. So we've got a couple products that are available for pre-order right now. And, um, you know, we want to capture those sales uh, before we actually get to shipping. Got it. So how do you think about and plan out the next six to 12 months for your business? Yeah. So, I mean, we're still trying to, to create new products, um, and, and, you know, find new partners that can drive the business forward. I think we, our passion is, is, is on the product development side of entrepreneurship. So, you know, you can see on the site, we've got a couple of new products, one from our Kickstarter campaign in uh, October and another we just launched um, about a month ago. And, you know, that's that takes up a lot of our time is focusing on getting those products out the door. You know, in addition to that, we sort of as a small team, we have to prioritize, you know, what else are we going to do? Are we going to um, you know, work on some partner? Uh, sorry, are we going to work on some partnerships with Spirits Brands? Are we going to get into some new wholesale outlets? You know, what, what does that look like? And, you know, really just picking the handful of things that we can actually get done in a year. Awesome. Thank you so much for your time, Chris. So wintersmiths.com is the website. Again, I really appreciate you coming on. Awesome. Thanks for having me, Felix. Here's a sneak peek for what's in store in the next Shopify Masters episode. It opens doors. You have an association with major brands, whether it's going to be, you know, Star Wars with Disney or Marvel. 
uh, whether it's the NFL or NBA. Thanks for listening to Shopify Masters, the e-commerce marketing podcast for ambitious entrepreneurs. To start your store today, visit shopify.com slash masters to claim your extended 30-day free trial. Also, for this episode's show notes, head over to shopify.com slash blog.